God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. I want to welcome our online viewers as well. And again, I always say this, but I mean this. Uh, nothing random, uh, no coincidence. I believe God has led us here today uh, to speak to us. And so thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for joining us uh, online. And I'm excited for what the Lord is doing. We're excited as we move into our Thanksgiving service next Sunday uh, night at 6 o'clock. We're going to do our celebration this has kind of become a tradition of ours. I've talked about the baptisms as we've had over 20 baptisms over these last couple of months. We're going to celebrate that uh, next Sunday night. And so we're going to do the sign up as well, but we're also going to live stream it. And so if you can't get here next Sunday night, we will also live stream the service. But today we're going to kind of begin a little mini series today and then next Sunday, kind of a two week mini series. And then we're going to move into a four week series at Christmas. And I'm excited about that. But for the next two weeks, I want to talk about the faithfulness of God. Take your Bibles and turn with me to a book I've never said before. Turn with me to the book of Lamentations. Ooh, there we go. Yeah, we're going to get some reactions this morning. So we've been in Isaiah, so take a right. If you can find Isaiah, Psalm Proverbs, go to the right, find Isaiah, and then take a right. You're going to go to Jeremiah, and then after Jeremiah comes Lamentations, written by Jeremiah. Now, Lamentations is not a book that you're going to hear songs written on Caleb about, except for a little portion, a little portion that we're going to look at this morning in chapter 3. But I want to start by just simply asking a question. Do we believe that God is faithful? Now, in church, we're quick to say that, right? I knew all the church answers as a preacher's kid. I knew as a preacher's kid, whatever the question was, just say, Jesus, and you're going to get close to the answer, right? I remember growing up, and they would do the Old Testament studies, who, who led God's people to cross the Red Sea, and I would just say, Jesus. And they're like, no, Moses did. And I'm like, well, Jesus was over it. And so if you say that, man, you're just going to get the answer right every time. I kind of learned that. And so when it comes to that question, we give a church answer. Yes, he's faithful. What about when you're on your knees in the middle of the night, crying, because you don't sense the presence of God at all. What about when you're waiting on something and you're, praying and you're 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 praying and you don't see anything? Like, like what about when you get a phone call that literally changes the direction of your life? Like in that moment of sorrow and despair, like can you honestly say, my God is faithful? You come to Lamentations, and that is really the central question that's being asked there. If we, we kind of move a little bit forward. We've been in Isaiah for the last couple of weeks, right? And in Isaiah, you have kind of pre-captivity of the Babylonians, right? And so Isaiah is prophesying somewhere in the 700s. Now you come to the 500s. You come to 586 B.C. If you remember your Old Testament timeline, 586 B.C. is the time when the Babylonians came and invaded the southern kingdom took God's people into captivity and destroyed Jerusalem. So what you have at Lamentations is you have Jeremiah, this man of God, and we're going to give you a little bit of a bio of him. He's known as the weeping prophet for a reason. But you have Jeremiah basically walking through the destruction of, of Jerusalem. I mean, think about this. There's people that aren't there anymore. His neighbors who have been murdered. Women who have been taken and raped and sold into slavery. Kids who have been taken from families. People that he once knew are not there anymore. The temple completely destroyed. And he's walking through the rubble of Jerusalem. And what you find in Lamentations is a man who lays his heart out. It is raw. It is real. To the point that there's places in here in chapter 3 that we're going to look at where he says, God, you've shut out my prayers. That's what he says. It's in God's word. You shut out my prayers. You don't even hear me. There's passages in here where he describes God as a lion or a bear who is out to devour him. You don't hear that on Caleb. You don't hear that on Caleb. That takes a different version to the song like a lion, right? He's pouring his heart out, trying to see God in the midst of destruction. When you can't see the hand of God, you've got to what? Trust the heart of God. And so what you find in Lamentations is raw and real. He's laying his heart out to the Lord. And then you find a little beautiful section, chapter 3, verse 21 through 24, is where we're going to land this morning. 
Now, before we stand and read, let's talk a little bit about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Well, lamentations, right, it means to lament. The definition of lament is this, to express grief, sorrow, or deep regret through words or actions. That is what we find in lamentations, the laments of Jeremiah. Now, a little bit about Jeremiah, right? He, the Bible tells us he began his public ministry at a young age, at the age of 17. And for 40 years, God called him to speak truth to people who rejected it, people who rejected him. I mean, we're talking about he was, he was beaten, he was placed into stocks, like the stocks meaning those things that hold your legs and hold your arms because he was being obedient, because he was delivering a message that wasn't very popular, that he was coming to the kings and, and God's people and saying, listen, God is faithful in his promises, but he's faithful in his judgment. And he has promised that if we do not turn from sin, if we do not turn from our idols, there will be judgment. And they rejected that message. I remember in seminary, our uh, professors would say to us, he would say, you know, some of you guys are going to be called to difficult ministries. Some of you guys are going to be called to churches and, and people that may reject the message. And I praise God, he didn't call me there. I'm thankful for this church. But he says, before you start whining, spend some time with Jeremiah. I remember my professor saying that. Dude was thrown in a cistern and left to die because of the message of truth, of one of those water things, and basically was sinking in mud. So this dude, the Bible tells us you don't even have one record of a conversion in the preaching and the ministry of Jeremiah. Think about that, for 40 years. And so here is this man now walking through Jerusalem in its destruction, and you find the words of lamentations. It's raw. It's real. It's so real that there's places in here where he considers God his enemy. And then you come to this beautiful passage, but I want you to see something. Take your Bibles and stand with me if you would. Lamentations chapter three. We're gonna read verses 21 through 24. I pray you're encouraged this morning. Right now you're depressed, but I pray you're encouraged this morning as we work through this passage. But what's so interesting about this is right before we get to 21 and 24, back up a little bit and look at verse 17 and 18. Look at these words. Maybe you can relate. My soul has been excluded from peace, is what he says. I have forgotten happiness, is what he says. My strength, my strength, notice that has failed, and so has my hope from the Lord. Then you come to verse 21 and you see a redirection. You see a man who takes his mind and says, you know what? I'm not going to focus on what I can just see. I'm going to turn my mind to truth. I'm going to redirect my mind to the promises and the covenant that God has made with me and our people and then you find these beautiful words. Look at verse 21. This I recall to my mind. Notice that phrase. This I recall to my mind. Therefore I have, say it with me, key. We're going to spend some time on that word this morning. Therefore I have, how do you cope? You cope because of hope in the Lord. Not just random hope, hope in the promises of the Lord. Look at what he says. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions, notice that plural, his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. And it leads him in the midst of the rubble to say these words, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope. Two words in. Join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we claim that this morning that our hope is in you. Whether we can see it or not. When we can't see your hand, Lord, we have to trust your heart. We have to trust who you are. We have to trust the promises of who we are in Christ. Lord, I pray we may see Jesus this morning in the midst of it all. We just came out of that series of Jesus in the middle. And Lord, I pray that whatever you have us in the middle of, we would see you. That your mercy and your compassions are fresh, new, every morning. And you are faithful. You're in control of this thing, Lord. And as we look around in our world, it's hard for us to kind of reconcile what's happening. But, Lord, we believe that you are sitting upon your throne and that you are sovereign over it all and that there's a plan and a purpose. And so, Lord, this morning, with whatever we walked in here with, Lord, whoever's watching what they're dealing with right now, Lord, it is not random that you've called us here together. May you speak truth by your Holy Spirit in our hearts. May we be changed 
And we pray it and we ask it in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I'm stirring this morning. I'm just going to warn you. No rebel, no energy drink. I'm just stirring this morning. This passage has been on me for weeks as we've come to this Thanksgiving time of year. Like it's just something that's it's crazy how the Lord just allows things to come together. Like it's amazing. And in the position I'm in, I see it all the time. I mean, I just see how the Lord just kind of meshes things together. And this passage of scripture with what we're dealing with, I know in our own lives, in our world, man, I just want you to be encouraged this morning with wherever you are. And I pray you see the application of Jeremiah. Look at what he says here in verse 21. He's gone through this whole thing, right? The Lord is against me. The Lord doesn't hear me. And then you come to verse 21 and he redirects. And this is key. This is key. He redirects his mind. He is intentional to move his mind off of what it's naturally drawn to. Because what it's naturally drawn to by the sinful flesh is doubt and despair and worry and anxiety. And how does all this going to work out? He says, nope, I'm going to recall my mind. I'm going to redirect my mind. The word recall means to return and to remember. And it's interesting here, the word mind can also be translated heart. And in the Hebrew language, it's basically considered the center of your being. So he is saying, I'm going to recall my heart and mind. I'm going to remember something. And he's going to get to what he's talking about. But what he's literally doing, what he's literally saying is, I'm going to preach to myself. Every day, I'm going to preach to myself. You didn't know this. All y'all are preachers, every one of you. If you know the Lord as your Savior, you've been called to preach. Maybe not on stage, but you've been called to preach to yourself. And there's a message that you have to preach to yourself. And this is what Jeremiah does, and he models this for us. Look at what he says here at the end of verse 21. He says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Now that phrase there in the Hebrew language means endurance with expectancy. Let me say that again. Hope. Endurance, but expecting. Endurance knowing that there's a promise that cannot be broken. I saw this quote this last week. I think it's so good. If you've got a pen, write it down. Biblical hope, hope does not come from our circumstances. Biblical hope comes for our circumstances. I want to take credit for that, but I can't. Let me say it again. Biblical hope doesn't come from our circumstances. Good luck finding it in your circumstances, but it comes for your circumstances. And we're going to explain what that means. So what, is, what exactly should we recall in our mind? Look at what he says in verse 22. It's a good question. Let's answer it. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Why do you have hope? What are you recalling to your mind? He says, through the Lord's mercies. Your translation may say loving kindness. Through the Lord's loving kindness, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Now, there's a lot to break down in just that one verse of scripture. First of all, the word Lord is capitalized in the English. In the Hebrew, it's Yahweh. And so it's speaking of a covenant-keeping God. That Yahweh has a covenant with his people that cannot be broken. And so just in the name Yahweh, he's claiming a promise. He is saying, I recall to my mind, there's hope because I'm redirecting my mind. Well, what are you redirecting your mind to? To God's mercies, to God's compassions that fail not. I love this. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. The word mercies, your translation again may say loving kindness. Your translation may say faithful love. Another translation, I believe the ESV says steadfast love. What it means is a loyal love that cannot be broken. You got to see this picture here, man. It conveys a love that never gives up, a love that never quits, a love that will not let go because it's not based upon emotion. It's based upon who he is. It's not something he does. It's who he is. It's not based upon us. There's nothing you can do today to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do today to make God love you less. You understand that? What he is saying here is his love is complete. His love is full. His love is perfect. Our hope for God's love isn't in, his, in our ability to keep his commands. Our hope is in his ability to just be God because that's who he is. It's his attribute. And I think some of the most painful words someone can hear is when someone says, I don't love you anymore. And I've met with people who have experienced that. That they've devoted their lives to someone. They've, they've shaped their life around someone. And to hear those words, I don't love you like I used to. 
Let me explain something to you. This love that is being described by Jeremiah is the opposite of that. It's a love that pursues in spite of. It's a love that is full in spite of. It's a love that won't let go. It's a love that will not quit. That There's nothing you can do to escape the love of God. And so he is saying, I have hope. I have hope. I have hope. And I'm going to redirect my mind. Why? Because of the mercies of God. I'm not consumed by my situation. And because his compassions fail not. I love this. Compassions is plural. Notice that. It literally means love in action. He is claiming the many ways that God loves him. That not just his mercies I'm not endured, but his compassions fail not. His compassions in the way that he saves us and redeems us and protects us and delivers us and blesses us and keeps us and comforts us and sustains us and secures us and strengthens us. I need an amen so I can catch my breath. His compassions fail not. In the midst of this rubble, Jeremiah says. Think about this. He's walking in the midst of destruction. He is seeing people who have lost their lives that's no longer there. Who have been taken into captivity. People he's grown up with. Family members, possibly. And he has to redirect his mind. That my hope isn't in these circumstances. It can't be. My hope is in the Lord. And why is my hope in the Lord? Because of his mercies and because of his compassions. Now look at what he says next. I love verse 23. Look at what he says. They are new every morning. Can I get an amen? You know what that means? It means they are fresh. They are fresh. It doesn't mean they didn't exist before. It means they are fresh every morning. There's something about fresh things. I'm going to tell you right now. Fresh bread. I love bread fresh baked bread. If you invite me over to your house, you ain't got to cook nothing else. Just give me bread and something to dip it in. And I'm cool with that. I'm not soliciting bread. I'm not. I did that with lemon cake years ago and it got out of hand. So I'm not, I'm not doing that. But if the Lord leads you, be obedient to his calling. I'm just saying, I love fresh baked bread. There's just something about it. Now, stale bread, not so good. You ever open up the bread thinking it's going to be good and you find something that's not so good. The picture that Jeremiah is painting is that his mercies and his compassion are fresh. They're fresh every morning. That they're going to show up on your doorstep. Now you got to find them. You got to recall your mind. You got to direct yourself to them because the world and your emotions want to consume you. And so you've got to be engaged in the battle. You've got to be intentional to say, I will recall these things. I will remember these things. His mercies will not fail, His compassion will not fail. And Lord, I want to see it today in my life. And it's fresh. But I love this too every morning. A sunrise. Let's think about this. Let's think about what he's describing here. Have you ever just seen a beautiful sunrise? And there's, there's some aspects of that sunrise that, that are unique, right? Number one, it's going to happen, right? There's the certainty of that sunrise. Like you're ready, you got your camera, and you got to go to the bathroom. It ain't waiting on you. It's still going to rise. You know what I'm saying? So it's certain. There's a key part to this. Also, it's unique. Think about this. The weather, the setting. There's a uniqueness to that sunrise. So picture what Jeremiah is saying, that every day God's mercy and his compassion is fresh. It's not stale. It's fresh. And number one, it's going to show up. Like a sunrise, it's going to show up. It is certain. And guess what? Number two, it is unique. It's going to be unique to my situation. It's going to be unique to the place that God has me. But I've got to recall my mind. I've got to preach to myself because the world's preaching to me. My sinful nature is preaching to me. My emotions and my feelings are preaching to me. And so I've got to be intentional to put my eyes on the Lord. It doesn't happen naturally. It may for you, it doesn't for me. There's an act of the will that Jeremiah is speaking of. And again, the setting of this, he is seeing utter destruction. Look at the words even leading up to it. God, you've shut me out. There's no peace in my life. There's no happiness in my life. And then all of a sudden, but this I recall, the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. His compassions, they fail not. They are new every day morning and look at the end of verse 23 you ready 
the end of verse 33, great, say it with me, great is your, great is your, take your hymn books right now and turn to 429, your hymn books, are in, they're in the back of the chair, some of you just looked right there, y'all did, remember this song? Written in 1929. Our brand's going to start us, and then we're going to sing it. And we're going to put the words on the board. We're going to put the words on the screen. Go ahead. There, there it is right there. And where God has you right now, I want you to th think about these words. Just get us started, because I'm not. Just get us started. Here we go. Sing it. All right, be quiet, Brandon. All right, that was the practice run. Now we're going to sing. <laughs> now we're going to sing. All right, we're going to sing. Where you're at, where I'd ever rubble and destruction or doubt and despair, we're going to sing. We're going to claim the promises of God. Here we go. Ready to get us started? Y'all better sing. I want to hear y'all sing. Here we go. Great is thy Verse 24, the Lord is my portion. And don't miss what Jeremiah is saying here, right? A, a portion or a plot, right? You go back 2,500 years ago, that was their lives. It was their livelihood. Like, that's how they lived. That's what sustained them. That, that's what they did. That was their identity, their portion. And now it's gone. And so Jeremiah has no land, he has no building, he has no family. Like he's looking at it going, okay, I've been stripped of everything. But the Lord is my portion. I remember hearing years ago, I was sitting out there and I heard a pastor say, if God took everything away from you, every blessing in your life that he's ever given you, would he still be enough? Like, would he still be enough? Like sometimes our blessings, right? There's a temptation in all of our lives that, that the enemy don't care. He'll take the blessings of God and try to get us to put that on the throne where Christ should be. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can say, well, my family's my portion. My job's my portion, right? My possessions are my portions. Be careful putting anything in the place where only Christ should be. Because I don't know about you, but in my life, he has a tendency to remove those things, and when he removes those things, he says, listen, he, don't you understand that those things can change in an instant? Only I will remain. Can I get an amen? So here's Jeremiah looking at destruction. Here's Jeremiah with despair. Here's Jeremiah with anger. But he says, the Lord is my portion. I've been stripped of it all. History tells us he was stoned to death. Doesn't tell us that in the Bible. But it tells us that he died for this message. And here he is looking at utter destruction, and yet he claims the Lord is enough because the Lord will never change. Those things may fail, the Lord will never fail. Those things may leave, the Lord will never leave nor forsake me. Therefore, my life, my portion, Christ is going to sit on the throne of my heart. And all these things, right, all these things may change, but my anchor is in the Lord. Man, what a promise that he's proclaiming here. And I think there's a constant battle in all of us, man. I mean, now that I'm a father, I see how easy a child can become a portion. Your family can become a portion. Your activities can become a portion. And the Lord will remove those things. I used to tell our teenagers as a youth pastor, man, be careful what you put in the place of Christ. 
because it can change in an instant. And so here is Jeremiah stripped down of everything. And look at what he says at the last part of verse 24. The Lord is my portion, and now the tone of his voice has changed. The Lord is my portion, therefore, therefore, because the Lord is in the proper place of my life, therefore my hope is in him. My hope is in him. Notice this, it is sandwiched between hope. The passage begins with hope and it ends with hope. Hope is critical, knowing that Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, cannot break his promises. There's not one promise in here that can be broken. There's some of you that need to go grab a promise. There's some of you that need to find a promise and then attach it to the lie of the enemy and say, you know what? No, this is my God, my covenant-keeping God, my promise-keeping God. He will not fail. And you battle it. You engage in it. I remember in my life, man, there was a time where I was struggling. And there's plenty of times I was struggling, but there was one season that every Sunday to get to this stage was a battle. I preached the sovereignty of God, and I preached the promises of God, but I was struggling with believing it. And I remember my father saying to me, you know what, Heath, you you need to, to write out these promises. Attach the lie, attach the promise to the lie. And so what I did was I took sticky notes and I began to just write the promises of God and I'd stick them right on my mirror so that when I woke up in the morning, I would recall that when I woke up in the morning and my flesh and my heart wanted to go that direction, I would go, nope, I'm gonna put my eyes on these. Whether I believe them or not, I'm gonna put my eyes on these. I'm going to engage in the battle and I'm gonna trust that the Lord will fulfill his promises. Because the enemy don't care. He'll take anything he can. He has no original material. And he'll take the things that God is trying to do in your life and directly use those things to light them. So we've got to counter that. And this is what Jeremiah is saying. The Lord is my portion. I will recall his mercies. I will recall his loving kindness. Therefore, therefore my hope is in him. I mean, here we are now on the other side of the cross, right? Here we are now on the other side of the resurrection. Like, our hope has already been won, right? I mean, he's claiming this even before Jesus. How much more should we, 2,500 years later, on this side of the cross, say, no, my hope is secure. This world can go any direction that it wants to. Jesus is still sitting on his throne. And the promises of God's word are secure. But I got to fix my eyes on it. So here's the practical application. Remember in seminary, we would do something called a preaching lab. It was quite a godly experience. You would stand in front of about 15 seminary students, and they would critique you in a sermon. It was always fun. I always enjoyed that time. And I remember after you would preach that sermon, the professor, our preaching professor, would stand up and he'd say, well, what do you want me to do about it? And I'm like, what do you mean? What do you... He's like, okay, you preach the passage. What do you want me to do about it? What do you want me to do with the passage? I'm like, do whatever you want to do. You got the Holy Spirit in your life. That wasn't the right answer. That wasn't the right, that wasn't the right answer. What do we do about this? Number one, we preach to ourselves. We have to. Because understand, the world's preaching to you. Your flesh is preaching to you. Your emotions are lying to you. So we got to preach to ourselves. In the midst of the rubble, like Jeremiah, regardless of what you're looking at, you got to stand and say, you know what, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, his mercies are enduring me. His loving kindness, his compassions will fail not. Therefore, I have hope. I'm going to lift my eyes. I'm going to lift my eyes off of all this mess down here, and I'm going to put my eyes on the one who is sitting upon his throne. we got to preach to ourselves. What do we preach? We have to preach God's word. This is why you've got to be in this book, man, because you've got to find the truth to attach to the lies. And if you're not seeking truth, the lies don't stop. They come even more. So we've got to get into God's word. You've got to find the place that's countering where the enemy is working. And you've got to recall. You've got to recall. You've got to remember that may be on your phone. That may be sticky notes on your mirror. It may be on your, on your car windshield. Don't do that. Wherever you've got to do, you've got to find truth. You got to put it in front of you. You got to preach to yourself. But you got to know that we're not fighting for victory. The victory's been won. Can I get amen? We're called to walk in it. And the enemy don't want you to know that. The enemy wants you to think it's based upon you. It's not based upon you because if you're like me, you're going to fail every day. 
it's based upon the one who's already won the victory. So we claim it. We say, nah, dude, you can talk to him that way. Nah, dude, it ain't on me. It's on Jesus. And Jesus is already, you can snap too. Jesus has already done what he needs to do. <laughs> Gotta be engaged, man. Because if not, just like Jeremiah, you're gonna be taken down a road and all you see are the questions, the doubts, the despair, and you'll miss, I'll miss, the work that God's trying to do in the midst of this. That was a work he was doing in the midst. And Jeremiah proclaimed it. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Where you're at this morning, I want you to hear this passage in full, okay? Where you're at this morning, not a mistake, those watching right now, not a mistake. Those who might watch later, not a mistake. Even at home, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And I want you to hear these words of Jeremiah. Practical application right here. This I recall to my mind. And I have hope because of it. Through the Lord's mercies, I am not consumed. Through the Lord's mercies, I am not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new. They are fresh every morning. Great God is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I hope in him. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning and Lord, we claim these words before you. But Lord, like Jeremiah, Lord, we we lay our hearts before you, and so, sometimes that's anger, sometimes that's disappointment, but Lord, you know our hearts even before we speak it. And in the midst of it, Lord, may you lift our eyes to see the God whose promises cannot be broken, to see the God who is love, not just what he does, but it's who you are, and that love cannot fail. The love of others may fail us, and they do, and they have, but your love cannot fail. It pursues us. In spite of us, regardless, it pursues us. It covers us. It sustains us. Lord, we thank you for your unconditional, everlasting, loyal love. And our hope is in you. And so, Lord, our prayer is that you would be our portion, that we would seek first the kingdom of God. And then everything else will find its proper place. May each day, Lord, we be engaged in the battle. Not just going through life, Lord, that there's a battle behind the scenes. May we recognize that and be engaged. May we preach to ourselves the truth of who you are, the truth of who we are in you. I stay fixed upon the one who accomplished it all. It's done. It's finished. We thank you for Jesus, for his death, for his resurrection. And I pray, Lord, if there's one in this room, one who is watching, who has never professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, even right now in this moment, as you pursue them, just lay their lives down before you and just simply say, Jesus, I believe in you. I put my faith in you. I've led my own life, and Lord, I'm asking you now to lead it, yourself in me. To believers in this place, Lord, who may have walked in broken and beaten down, like Jeremiah, lift our eyes to you because that's where our hope is found. Your compassions fail not. We thank you for that. We pray these things in the name that won it all. The precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, 